Welcome, everyone. Uh, you can turn that down a little bit. Check, check, check. One, two, check, check, check. Thank you. Check. That's good. Okay. Um, this um, um, lecture will be on ease, electronic auditory stimulation effects, and, audit and sensory processing disorder. Um, I th this is for Ease Pro, so I think we've got therapists in here. Um, if is there uh, anyone in here who has dealt with a child that has sensory processing disorder, or has a child that has sensory processing disorder? Children with the sensory processing disorder, yeah. Um, sensory processing disorders uh, goes across the spectrum of of all neurologically disorganized children or brain injured children. It's not uh, just uh, related to autism. The first um, sen uh, PD kid I met with um, diagnosed with cerebral palsy and many kids that I met had been, uh, had um, autism but also non-specific uh, diagnosis. So uh, I have a, a lecture and because we are Streaming, I'm going to kind of uh, read through my lecture, and if I get too boring, just somebody throw something at me, and I'll be fine. Wake me up really bad. Okay, um, my name is Bill Miller. Uh, I'm a Grammy-nominated audio engineer. I'm also a NASA Constellation software developer and game designer with 40 years of experience in those various fields. Um, I've been a student of brain injury since 1985 and have developed a wide range of products to help brain injured children cope with sensory processing disorder. Um, currently, there are about 10,000 therapists from around the world using my uh, tool. I'm not a therapist, I'm a student of these, these guys and I build tools for therapists and, and for parents. Uh, Tibor Horvath, my partner here, is the president of Audio Forge Labs. He's a senior chemical engineer and my partner in the development of what we believe is the most significant use of mobile technology device to help children with SPD we've ever developed and that's the Ease app system. Today we're going to talk about the Ease Pro app. Um, the Ease app uh, system con is uh, uh, built of the Ease personal app for the family, for the parent, and the Ease Pro app for the therapist and they integrate together. And the, the cool thing about them is that uh, you can have one therapist who, could, who is managing a, a program of 30, 40 children in different countries, doesn't matter. You can manage it over great distances. So sensory processing disorder is a condition where upon receiving a sensory message, the brain is unable to respond appropriately. The brain can be hypersensitive or hyposensitive and the problem can range from mild to severe. Sensory processing disorder affects at least one in 20 people in the general population. When young children are affl afflicted with sensory processing disorder, all other aspects of their development are affected, resulting in lifelong difficulties. Since 1985, I have studied a form of SPD called auditory processing disorder, or APD, and have developed technological approaches to help individuals learn to cope with noise using music and virtual world environments. My latest effort is the Ease Listening Therapy app, a sophisticated device utilizing the power and portability of Apple's computers iDevices. And in this lecture, Tibor and I will discuss sensory and auditory processing disorders, the history of electronic auditory stimulation effect, or what's called Ease um, tools, which are music CDs and games, and the Ease Listening Therapy app for iDevices. So adaptation, habituation, and acclimation are all terms that describe the neurological process of a living organism modifying its behavior in response to a change in its environment. All living things must habituate, adapt, and acclimate in order to survive. We adapt microscopically and macroscopically. We adapt nearly instantaneously and over generations. We adapt autonomically, subconsciously, and consciously. We adapt to an increase in oxygen requirement with vasodilation and deeper breathing. We adapt to increased light levels with when our pupils constrict or we cover our eyes. 
We adapt to noisy environments by constricting our tympani tensor muscles or covering our ears. We adapt to higher temperatures by sweating or removing clothing. So we adapt automatically or we have a behavior adaptation. These are survival skills. Birds must adapt to every puff of wind or they're going to fall out of the sky. Humans must adapt to their surroundings in order to eat, sleep, breathe, move, and interact within the human social structure. But for brain injured children, there's a problem. Our ability to adapt is dependent on receiving accurate information about our environment. When a child or adult is injured in a sensory neural pathway, the information in that sense is distorted and we become hypo or hypersensitive. Underreaction to those senses is called hyposensitivity, and overreaction is called hypersensitivity. Hyposensitivity is much easier to understand than hypersensitivity. For example, neurological visual impairment is easy to understand from a sensory processing perspective. The eyes and optical nerves are intact. However, due to an injury, the brain is unable to process the information, and the result is visual impairment or blindness. Auditory hyposensitivity results in deafness. Other sensory processing disorders are more complex and not easily understood. For example, auditory hypersensitivity can be extremely confusing to diagnose and treat. Symptoms can range from mild distraction and inability to concentrate to such severe pain and discomfort that eventually the child shuts down and becomes unresponsive to his or her surroundings. As the child grows, he or she can develop an aberrant defense mechanism and can appear confusingly hypersensitive to some sounds and oblivious to other sounds. A hypersensitive child will consciously block out all external stimulation and replace it with a controllable, predictable stimulus called stealth stimming. Most of us in here have known children that have these, that are in this condition where they stim, they control their environment the best they can by stimming. Sensory defensiveness and stimming may keep the patient alive, but it's a dead end, leading down a dark alley of seclusion, isolation, and despair. Caregivers must try to break into the sensory defensive stimming loop with techniques and tools to teach a child's brain that the aberrant act is not only unnecessary, but is itself dangerous. When they are successful, the brain will react and adapt by growing in a predictable and positive manner, eventually freeing the child from his or her sensory prison. Attempting to change a child's behavior instead of helping them cope with their environment is addressing the wrong issue at the wrong time. First, we have to help them with what they're perceiving, and then we can help them respond to it. In 1985, I began studying brain injured children when I joined the board of directors of the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential in Philadelphia. My background was in, was in audio engineering and psychoacoustics. I was fascinated by the children who were clearly experiencing sound in a way I had previously not seen or heard before. It was clear to me that auditory hypersensitivity was a condition shared by a great many kids with widely varying diagnoses. The first auditory hypersensitive child I met was a young man named David Bogusky. David had a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, but David was desperately auditory hypersensitive. David's body was so twisted from his brain injury that in his early teens, his feet pointed almost backwards, and he had the body of an eight-year-old. David and his family were terrorized by sound. His beautiful mother would carry him everywhere she went, many times screaming in her ear. His parents wore pillows on their feet and tiptoed around their home because if they made even the slightest noise, David would dissolve into a hysterical, terror-filled mental collapse. Then in the 1980s, the Boguskis found the Institutes. I was there as a new member of the board at the time. Over a period of only a few weeks, I watched David progress from a terrified child disconnected from the world from by his fear of sound to a boy reaching out to the world and communicating with his family for the first time in his life with smiles and hugs. His mother was over the moon ecstatic, ready to giggle and laugh every time I saw her. 
her life had been changed as much as David's had. As an experienced audio engineer, I was floored by this entire sequence of events. First, how was it that this child did not hear sounds just like I heard sounds? I had never really understood brain injury before that day I met David. I had always thought that brain damaged, this is not my term, individuals as permanently intellectually deficient. It had just not occurred to me that their sensory pathway could be affected as well. Brain injury, Glenn Doman's almost exclusive term in the middle 1980s and early 1980s, on the other hand meant that healing was not only possible, but given the natural restorative abilities of the body was to some extent, and given the right conditions, likely. And worth repeating, I realized that brain injury affected all aspects of the brain, both expressive and sensory. It was a bolt from the heavens that still took me years to fully absorb. So how on earth did they do it? They did it with pots and pans and air horns. Glenn Doman, after 35 years of observing brain injured children, understood hypersensitivity. He understood that hypersensitivity was an aberrant, reflexive response to sensory stimulus and that through the natural process of neurological organization and development, low-level reflexes could give way to higher-level conditioned responses, habituation. He also understood the importance of frequency, intensity, and duration of sensory stimulus in the proper conditioning process of neurological development. We all see this every day. Those of you with your kids, you see what, how they change in response to their environment. Although he did not overtly talk about it at the time, he also understood sensory randomness in the process of neurological development. And that random sensory information is, is key to helping a child uh, habituate to the world. So how on earth did they do it? Glenn and the staff of the institutes taught the Bogusky family to randomly create extremely short duration, extremely high intense noises within earshot but out of eyesight of David. They used wood blocks, pots and pans, and air horns. And I'm not kidding. The high intensity of the sounds caused a profound reaction in David. He would startle wildly the first time, but less the second, and even less the third. The intensity of the sounds was actually building new neurological pathways within his brain, creating a, a habituation response to override his primitive startle reflex and raising the threshold below which he did not even react. However, the uniquely short duration of the intense sounds did not cause him to collapse into a fight or flight condition. Had the duration of the sounds been a few milliseconds long, or a few seconds long, excuse me, they would have been torturous. Obviously, a few seconds of loud noises for a child that is auditory hypersensitive, and he will melt down. However, had the duration, uh, However, uh, instead of a few hundred milliseconds, the effect was wondrous. So if, the, so if the stimulation is extremely short and highly intense, we don't trigger the fight or, fight or flight response, but we do trigger a neurological action within the brain. And that's our habituation. The mechanical treatment approach of the institutes was to create a controlled startle reflex in the children in order to help them adapt and habituate to noise. This apparently barbaric approach is in reality brilliant in its simplicity and effectiveness. The transient nature of the stimulus makes it too short for the child to muster a fight or flight response. The intense volume is sufficient to cause a neurological adaptation. The child learns to cope with noise by coping with noise. The only thing missing was an active participation on the part of the child. In 1992, I met Paul Medul, who was establishing auditory integration therapy in North America. Now, that's seven years later. I, I, I met David in 1985, so I am very embarrassed by how long it takes me to learn something, but that's how it goes. Um, it took me seven more years to figure this out. After meeting with Paul, I immediately saw a parallel with the pots and pans program. There were the short, intense, high-frequency bursts to train a patient to 
adapt to auditory stimulus, and AIT did seem to function by all reports. But there were important differences, too. AIT used music as a source for the stimulus. That's fine. Uh, AIT was limited to children above four years old, something did not, that did not sync with the early intervention or the earliest intervention possible, which was a, a key dome in, in, uh, innovation. AIT was not particularly child-focused either, as many kids had difficulty, still do, wearing headphones in a busy and sometimes noisy therapist office, or traveling across the country hundreds of miles and staying in a hotel room to get a therapy that's almost undone by the, by the conditions that they have to go through in order to uh, get the therapy in the first place. The theory upon which AIT was founded was troubling to me. Dr. Berard claimed that in autism, the tympani tensor muscle in the middle ear was flaccid. He described a process whereby this muscle was exercised and hearing was restored to normal. He also described sound as feeding the brain like a nutrient. And Dr. Tomatis had very troubling views, in my, my opinion, regarding the refrigerator mother model of autism, contribute, and, and, and I did not agree with that in, in any way. He also ascribed intelligence to the ear mechanism, and I found that troubling. As a student of psychoacoustics, which I had been for years. I haven't even talked about my audio background, but I've studied psychoacoustics uh, since the early 70s. Um, I knew that the ear mechanism was no more intelligent than the fingers I used to type this lecture. It is the brain that sees, hears, feels, tastes, smells, balances, and is aware of the body. It uses wonderful tools, eyes, ears, skin, tongue, and nose, but it is the brain that contains the intelligence. The source of nutrients for brain cells are beyond the scope of this lecture, but sound is not one. There were other problems. Dr. Borard claimed success treating depression and other psychological problems. Therapists were trained to push this button for depression and push that button for autism, something that just horrified me. The medical community was skeptical, and so was I. Now, the required music list was comprised of copyrighted albums, and none of the practitioners had performance licenses. So this is not a really functional problem, but it's a problem that therapists had. The albums were in English, too, further restricting their uh, universality. But from my perspective, AIT did fit right into the concept of sensory stimulation, neurological growth, habituation, and adaptation. Sensory experiences and stimulus are clearly responsible for neurological development and organization. We've seen this nature-nurture argument for years and years and years, and anyone who's helped a brain-injured child get better knows that what you start with is your nature and what you end with is your nurture. Every keystroke I make or sound I hear reinforces or creates a new pathway within my brain. Stimulating, challenging, and promoting growth in sensory processing is much more understood today, but even then it was well understood by Glenn. Using music as a foundation for AIT was a good decision too. It engages and relaxes the patient, causing them to listen through the stimulus, making their adaptation purposeful and effective. I needed to know more so that I could, so I needed to know more about this so that I could adapt it or figure out how to use this information. So I took an AIT machine into my studio and I analyzed its functions using signal generators and audio analysis tools. I ran white and pink noise through the device. I observed its output using fast Fourier analysis. I processed music through it to observe its triggers and filters. I measured its dynamic range and frequency response, and I came to the conclusion that the signal would fit into a 16-bit 44-1 music CD, digital CD. However, as I studied the device, it was clear that it did not react to all music the same. Louder songs triggered it too much, softer songs triggered it too little. Because therapists did not adjust the device for every song, a child might only experience one-third of the songs modulated appropriately for his or her condition. I needed to create a trigger procedure that could ignore volume differences in the source material, so the basic idea seemed logical in light of what I had seen with pots and pans, but the implementation was flawed, in my opinion. 
Using an improved process, I created many hours of encoded music with each song carefully balanced for optimum response. Picking music with a broad frequency response range was critical. In this way, music-based auditory stimulation on CD could actually exceed the performance of the AIT machines. I also decided to use properly licensed instrumental music for the source. This eliminated the legal problems that I felt AIT practitioners were sure to have at some point in their careers. I created a disc-based hybrid at-home program that would fit into the parents as therapists approach to the, of the institutes, and I called it Electronic Auditory Stimulation Effect, or the ECD. And it took me 10 years to get to that point. In 1998, ECDs, ECD1 through 4, were adopted by therapist Sheila Frick, and her training program was called Therapeutic Listening, and her company is Vital Sounds. Some of you may know this company. Vital Sounds then went on and added to their own library of therapeutic listening CDs, and then other companies followed suit, copying the work of Vision. As a result of our efforts and others like Vital Sounds, <coughs> Many thousands of children have benefited from auditory stimulation, now known as listening therapy programs. To date, we have distributed nearly 100,000 ECDs into the community, and there are 10,000 therapists currently around the world using our products. There have been many published case histories of children who have benefited from ECDs, and in 2007, the American Journal of Occupational Therapy published a study um, of therapeutic listening and concluded that, and I quote, the present study produced encouraging findings to support the use of therapeutic listening as part of an overall sensory integrative approach to occupational therapy in elementary school children. Therapeutic listening along with the sensory diet st strategies can be effective in reducing many behaviors associated with sensory integration disorder. Over the years, now we're getting to some of the other products that we've done. Over the years, mothers have asked me many times what activities would be appropriate for their children when they were listening to their ease music. Would reading a book be okay? Of course. Yes, of course. How about playing a video game? Well, not so much. Even though many of our kids love games, the game sound would create confusion while listening to the CDs, and it's a compromise playing a game without the sound. So in 2009, while I was on a break from designing uh, software for NASA Constellation Moon and Mars program, I decided to take these questions and my concepts to the next level and create a series of video games that incorporated sensory stimulation in the visual mode. I designed games that I believe little boys and girls could enjoy that would help stimulate and challenge their visual organization and concentration and help organize the visual, auditory, and vestibular triad that enables our ability to orient ourselves in space. I also designed a system to collect important data for each play session that would give therapists and researchers new insights into the performances of their patients. The result of that work was Ease Off-Road, Funhouse, Air Show, UFO, Snowmobile, and Rover games. These games are all driving or flying games that challenge and stimulate a child's vestibular orientation and help him or her improve visual attention Skill, uh, visual attention skills, spatial organization, and occupational performance. These games were studied at Bernal University in 2011, and they found our results conclude that Ease interactive games provided multi-sensory input, multi-system sensory input that promoted improved sensory modulation. The findings of this study conclude that based on means predictions, the benefits of using Ease games in music compact discs seen in the study's participants <coughs> could be generalized to the greater population of children with sensory sensitivities. They work. That brings us to today's lecture and the Ease Listening Therapy app. In 2010, I contacted a brilliant software developer, Tibor Horvath, and proposed that we collaborate on a project to bring the power and portability of Apple's iDevices to bear on the issue of auditory hypersensitivity in brain-injured children. Together, we could build a software solution that was unmatched even by hardware costing $10,000. We could bring the cost barrier down even further than ECDs had done 15 years earlier and make this critical technology available to nearly any child 
who needed it. Tibor was immediately interested in helping our kids, and he and I embarked on an 18-month exhaustive development effort that culminated not in a single app, but in a system of the Ease Pro and Ease Personal apps that empower both therapists and parents, and for the first time enables a therapist to manage a child's day-to-day -day program over thousands of miles of physical distance between them. <laughs> There were many more issues to manage than even I expected, especially my primary directive that we do no harm. The issues of proper triggering required pseudo-random number generation. We pushed the fidelity and dynamic range of iDevices to their absolute limit. We expanded every possible feature beyond anything ever done before and always kept our eyes on safety and effectiveness. <coughs> As a result, the Ease Listening Therapy app is superior to all disk-based auditory stimulation programs in that it provides access to variables to make the auditory stimulation less intense at the beginning of a program and more intense than possible on fixed CDs at the end of the program. This enables a child to accept the program more easily at first and then cope with an even more intense program at the end. Remember, they cope with noise by coping with noise. So if we can sneak up on them with the app in a very gentle setting and then progressively make the, in the intensity of the stimulation higher and higher and higher as we go along, we will progress, the child will progress faster and more effectively to being able to cope with noise in the world. At the end of every Ease listening session, the Ease personal app will collect all of the session data for songs encode settings, volume, and duration, and send that data to the therapist via an email. The therapist can then review the report and together with feedback from the parent, make adjustments to the child's program settings and send the new program to the Ease Personal app, again via an email. In this way, a therapist can keep close track on their patient's progress. The Ease Personal app is also simple enough to use to make it capable of being a standalone therapy for families who may not need or may not have access to or cannot afford the, the services of a dedicated therapist. So I'd like to introduce Tibor, and we will go through the technical features of the Ease Listening Therapy app. And you want to just bring your yeah. tools right up here? For sure. Do you just put that in your pocket. Yeah, I got one. On. Doing good. Do I have to push something here? Let me take a look. I'm good. I'm good. Awesome. Hi there. Whoops. And, and uh, we have a, a video online that's uh, linked on the uh, Vision Audio website. On the, uh, the Vision Audio website is easecd.com or easecd.com. And there's a about a 10-minute um, video that we've produced to so that it will walk you through the, the use of the disk. And we're also going to do some more um, some more work in in helping therapists understand what these various uh, parameters are for the ECDs or for the Ease app. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. All right. I'm going to dive right in. Um, <coughs> so these are some of the features that Bill has actually covered already, so I don't have to talk about them. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, what do you need to run the Ease app? So what do you need? Well, you need an iOS device, obviously, and it can be an iPad, it can be an iPod Touch. So uh, that brings your cost barrier down to a few hundred bucks for, for the device. Um, you can use your iPhone, too, if you have one already. Um, you need fairly good quality headphones. And I'm not going to go in that in a minute. And you need one of the versions of the Ease app, obviously. Um, so device is a given. Uh, why do we need headphones? Why do we need good headphones? Um, so our listening therapy works by uh, modulating bursts. So what we do is we run high frequency or, or we enhance the higher frequency of the music for a very short time. In order to do that, we, we, we need, or, or in order for the child to hear this right, the headphones have to have a certain quality. Don't use the white headphones that Apple gives you. They're 
not good quality, okay? You want something that covers the ears and has a wide enough uh, frequency uh, spectrum or frequency band. Um, typically, uh, good headphones are not expensive, or, well, I guess it depends what expensive is, but for 60 to 80 bucks, you can get good headphones. You don't have to go, <coughs> I'm not gonna drop names, but you don't have to go to 300, 400 bucks, I okay? One, two, two, two. Okay, um, we have tested three headphones for this. There, uh, there are other headphones from <coughs> Sennheiser that um, Vital Sounds uses that are 150 or 200 dollars. There's a lot of headphones out there that are 300 dollars that are not as good as these headphones. So I'll give you three numbers. Um, well, actually, I'm going to give you two numbers. They're both Sony's. Um, one is the M Sony MDR V6 headphones, those are about $80, uh, and they're studio quality headphones. And the other one is the Sony uh, MDR7506. And we don't sell these headphones. We, they're, not a, they're not a profit center for us. We just recommend these headphones. And if and you want to try the Sony uh, V6s, I have them here. So come to our booth yeah. and try them. And the, the, the 7506s are about $100. I, I'm not sure if I said that. So, so you don't have to spend $300 on a pair of headphones is the bottom line. And these are well guaranteed. So yeah, go ahead. for sure. <coughs> so, um, so the other thing I want to point out is um, the app works on all uh, three types of devices, touch, uh, phone, and iPad. It looks slightly different. Obviously, because of the bigger screen of iPad versus iPhone, it's exactly the same app. There are the same buttons, it's the same features, everything is exactly the same, so you don't have to think you need an iPad for it. Ni it's nicer to work on the iPad because it's big and you can run all these other cool apps that are here as well, but uh, it's not really necessary. So, um, what we're doing is, um, again, they're running the words over music. That's what you have to remember. And what we're trying to do is, um, or, or what we can do now, is adjust the verse intensity to your need. And how do we do that? So let's go through this quickly. So, so here are the points, and I, instead of just reading this out, um, you will be able to download these slides afterwards, so you don't have to take complete notes. I'm just going to go and show, yeah, okay. So this is Deep Pro. Um, I don't necessarily want to go through all the buttons in its main sequence. What I want to do is show you how you can increase uh, your intensity. So I'm just going to turn my volume up. He just grabbed the wrong channel there. Go ahead and keep playing. Yeah. We need the audio. It's not you.
you for a moment or two to stop just for a second. I'm going to interrupt Tibor for just for a second. We're going to play for you. Just you can turn this down again. We're going to play. That's my mic. Turn it down. Check, check, check. Good. What we're going to do is we're going to play the sound for you for th so that you can actually hear what the encoding is doing just for a few minutes, which is or for, for a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds. So you can hear what the filters are actually doing. And then Tibor can go through and describe the, uh, the process of how we get to those kinds of encoding. Yeah. So go ahead and do that. talked about gap length. That's the time between the bursts. Um, let's go to the next one, which is burst length, which obviously, uh, again, is how long does the burst take. And shorter bursts are less intense. So that's how easy it is, because the longer the burst, the more uh, loud pretty much. Uh, if you're going to attack, it's again the other way around. A shorter attack is more intense. So if you want to start with a low uh, intense setting, actually have a very long attack, you have a very short burst length, and you have a very long gap length. Okay? And this is this is probably the lowest oh hold on. What we what I haven't covered yet is uh, what this in the middle is, this big thing in the middle that I can move around. This is actually a, a high shelf filled that's what we call the high shelf filter. High shelf filter. Um, what you can do with this is uh, set how high the gain is of the of the burst, or high how strong the burst is, or how loud the burst is. Um, that's, that's your your movements up and down. And you see here in the top left this decibel number going to 22 now, and so on. So that's actually in decibels. So so you can you can get an idea of uh, how loud you can do these bursts. Uh, if you go left to right, it's actually, you can see on the right side there, uh, the frequency change. It's now at 8,010 hertz. So every all the, all the audio that's above that set point, which is now 4,000 hertz, will be enhanced at 25 decibels. So that's what this setting means. Now, if you, Again, let's look at the intensities. You start with a low intensity or, or low gain, and then you can go up. That's increasing your intensity. You can also go um, with less of the audio being enhanced. That's a low intensity to more and more audio being enhanced, being a high intensity. So, so again, another way to control how you want to change your intensity. Um, if you if you look at the if you go to back to the presets now now you get more of a of a feel of what these buttons actually do. And if I go to oh, I should have 
can do 14 hours. If I go to four, preset four, much higher settings. <laughs> Here the songs are always randomized, so even the music is randomized. You don't get the same song every time. So that's also an important aspect of, of the whole uh, thing. Now, I want to go back to my script, so I'm not forgetting anything. Um, here we go. This, is, this was increasing intensity. Um, so again, we, wanna, we don't want to do no harm. Um, when, you, when you have your child or somebody engaged with the app, always observe them, make sure they still enjoy what you're doing. If not, take the headphones off. Uh, you can also adjust the program. You know now how to reduce the intensity um, or increase it if you, f if, you, if you feel like there is more uh, progress being made. And again, the requirements vary and we're able to adjust for all the requirements with, with all our little knobs. So. We, we, we should talk a little about uh, session length, uh, which is uh, how long should this take on average. And again, it varies. W typically, we say 30 minutes. What you can do is, uh, and I'm going back to the app now, and show you how you can actually set the timer. So you go into the control panel, um, go into advanced settings, there is a timer button at the top, and here you can actually set how long you want your s session duration, okay? And when it's set, you can play, you can play and stop your music, but as soon as this, uh, so right now it's, you play for four music, you play for four minutes, okay? So as soon as this hits 30, it turns off, and you can't turn it back on, until you actually, um, until you actually go back to your advanced settings, your timer, and you clear the session timer. So this is also like a safeguard. We have lots of safeguards like this in there to not overexpose, okay? So that's the session time, or session length. Um, yeah, I, I see that you have um, the, the do not no harm again. One of the things that you'll find is that a child that is auditory hypersensitive will gravitate to this. They will put the headphones on generally happily and they will listen happily and they're always 99% of the time calmed by this. Um, listen, a, a person with a neurotypical auditory response will find it grating. And so when it's unusual <coughs> that we call it ease because when you listen to it, it's any, it seems anything but, but easy or easing to someone with a neurotypical response. But with someone with an auditory hypersensitive response, they generally find it very calming. I mean, that's the point of it all. Okay, now I'm, I, I want to talk about the preset, which is something that's very important, especially if, you, if you're a therapist and want to send a special setting to a parent, or if you're, one, if you're a parent and want to receive a setting for, from a therapist. So this is, I think, a key part that I should try to explain well. So, so let me try to do that. Okay, so let's say you're a therapist, you, you have made a special setting, and I'm going to make one that's easy to recognize because I'm just going to put all knobs on top and have this at roughly 10,000 and what here it is, 20, 21. So here is my setting. That's what I did. I'm a therapist. Now I go into uh, the, u to the user preset button and well, I save the current setting and I call it uh, demo one. Okay, so it's saved now. Um, Whenever I, so I'm changing now to, to any of my other the fa factory presets. If I want to recall this demo one preset, I just push on it and it's there, as you expect, right? This isn't spectacular, this is nothing. Now, now it gets interesting when you want to email this to a parent. So you see that little uh, white chevron there in the blue circle? That's, you hit that and an email comes up 
email dialog comes up. So you enter the two fields, uh, which is going to be Bill. So I'm going to send this preset to, to Bill. You can add more text here if you want. Uh, it's just a normal e email field with the demo one uh, setting attached. So he sent this off and it said it cannot send because I don't have Wi-Fi here. But that doesn't matter. Anyways, it's, it's sent off and he'll receive it. Now, um, of course, what happens on the other side? So I have prepared an email. If I find it. So here, this is a previous email I received from uh, myself. And uh, this is the preset. So what you do is you push long on it until all these nice little things pop up. Um, yes, I'm running on iOS 6, so just ignore it. It's going to look like this next week for you too. Um, so you, you can select to either import it into Ease Pro or into Ease Personal, depending on what you have installed. Right. So um, I'm going to in import it now into East Pro because we've been working with that all the time. It's going to look exactly the same in East Person. Um, and now you have actually the setting. This is actually the setting. Uh, oh, it, it, it appeared here, John Henry. That's, that's the setting I emailed. So I select this, and um, that's the setting I have compared to the one I put in the demo, which looks like this. So very easy to send presets back. It's all integrated. Um, that's, oh yeah, well, how do you delete an e uh, a preset? You hit edit and you just delete it. There, it's gone. So these are the main uh, points of presets, save and send around. Uh, what the presets are for, uh, even in the pro version, um, you start a child off in preset one, it's very softly encoded, then you get feedback from the parents, yes, he's doing fine with that, then let's see if we can increase the intensity of the program, so then we'll go to preset two. The, child, the parent can use that preset for a ma number of days or a week or whatever, and then it, as, as the child is acclimated to preset two, the child is doing better, we're seeing better eye contact, um, language, then we can move to preset three, even more intense, um, and then on to preset four. So I know that looks very complicated, what, what we're showing you, but even a, as a therapist, you can still use just the presets one, two, three, and four, um, and, uh, and it's very easy to use. It's much easier to use than it, than it appears because we've created as many variables to create a custom program for a child as, as you would ever need. But we've also created the presets to make it as easy as possible for a therapist. So you don't need a master's degree in ease you know, therapy in order to use the, the Ease app. Essentially, we built the personal app to remove all that high level functionality and just have you run with the four uh, presets. So I have to hurry up a little. <laughs> so uh, we talked about reporting. Well, you've seen the reports pop up all the time. So I want to quickly show these to you. Um, so the, the way this works, if you have reporting enabled, um, and now I'm, of course, constrained because I cleared my settings. <laughs> so. Uh, the way you enable reporting is um, in here. There's a switch that says report. If you have it off, it's no report. So that's that's all there is. When when you when you play your session, when you play your um, therapy for 30 minutes or whatever you have set, and you're done, hit stop. Um, an email pops up with all the information about um, how you. Uh, what happened? So it, l it it records every song that's been played, how long each song was played, because the child actually has the option of skipping certain songs it doesn't like with the skip tab. So it's still going to be random. So nobody knows what's going to be the next song, but uh, it's there. So if if song if the song is really bad, you don't like it, go to the next. Um, 
So it records that, it records all the settings we have explained and some of them that we haven't explained. Um, and uh, so there, this is what the report would look like. Um, again, it's in email form, so you can throw in Bill's email and he gets lots of emails. Yeah, no, I want I want to I, I, I want to look at everything. So so the first thing I suggest you do is put in your comments and say this was a good session. This was uh, she wasn't focused or sh she was really into this and and so on. So so leave some comments, and and then you can look at the actual table. What we have here is well the song, what al album or what uh, module it is from. Um, how long each song was played. So the first song was played 15 seconds, then I skipped, didn't like it. Uh, and the next song was, was played 51 seconds uh, and so on. What the encodings uh, were, uh, burst length and so on, um, going all the way to the back uh, to some uh, rather uh, complex settings that we're actually not gonna cover today, unfortunately. Um, so this is, this is also being sent in XML, so you can export it to your Excel spreadsheet and keep track of things very easily. Okay, so this is sent. When, when I'm, I'm there is currently a study underway at Bernal University uh, on the EASE uh, app system, and they're taking the, the data from the emails and integrating that into their, into their data study. So part of the reason that we've created all this data is so that researchers can make, can get more clear information about the sessions that the child um, are doing and, and correlate that to behavior responses from the parent and from the therapist. Okay, so I, I jumped a couple of slides because we're actually already over. Um, uh, the, the last thing I want to talk about here is how you can add more uh, therapy modules into, into the app. So um, the easiest way, if you if you own the pro version, you can actually uh, go to Bill's website, uh, eStudio.com, and uh, acquire more modules there. Or you can also do it in in the app. So right in the app, we need internet access to show that. So I, I I can't really show you how it's done. But this is what the interface would look like. So you you, you see here. These are the, the, the available modules where how you can extend. And um, there's an explanation of how they sound, what they do. And that's pretty much that's pretty much all you need to know. Now, these are big files, okay? So do it on over Wi-Fi, don't do it over 3G or your you might have to go into a coffee shop to use your Wi-Fi if you don't have one. Um, it, it can take quite a while to download them and you're like, oh my God, it's not working. It is working, it just takes a long time. Now once they're, they're downloaded, we have, to, we have to also decompress them and process them. So, so again, this whole process might take up to 30 minutes, okay? So, so think about this when you're, when you're uh, acquiring more modules, um, give it time. <laughs> okay, so this is the modules. Now there is an in-help, uh, or in-app support, uh, you can email us right from the app. You can find more information in the app. It, it's all very easy to find. I'm not gonna show that. Um, I wanna come to my conclusions. So uh, we, ha we showed two studies uh, confirming that these tools work uh, and they work well. We have shown um, East Pro demonstrated the app, it, 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 is a, it, is a <sighs> it is almost our love child. We, we, we put a lot of effort into making this right and to, I think, to an extent that nobody will ever know. Um, it is almost like, well, it says here, a long history of improving listening therapy. It's really like the pinnacle of, of I mean, Bill just, moved everything just a level after level higher. So um, that's East Pro. East Personal has the same, all the same uh, functionality or, or all the same technology in there, but it's simplified so you can use it 
without having to think much, really. One, two, three, or four, you're done. Um, we're going to talk about these personal a little more uh, in our session tomorrow. Uh, I don't remember when it is, but is it 10 o'clock again? Okay, at 10 o'clock in, in one of the rooms. So if you want to join us there, um, we'd love to see you. That's right. That's right. We have a table too. We're on, we're on booth 21. Come by. You can play around with both apps. You can listen to them with headphones, uh, cheap ones and expensive ones. And but all of them are good. Uh, and yeah, thank you for listening. I don't know. Do we have time for questions? Two minutes? Okay, we have two minutes. Does anyone have a question? Did, uh, are you talking about oh, oh. Other, other video games? Other video games. Yeah. You want to turn me down a little bit? Yes, if they're not listening to sound, playing video games, sitting on the floor, reading a book, uh, doing puzzles, all of those quiet uh, time activities are appropriate if they're, if they're listening to the app. Um, if you want them, the, the best, they're playing, if they want to play a video game, we also have video games. So we have a variety of tools. Yeah, but, okay. But usually reading and, and playing with whatever on the floor is, is always good. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. No. 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 The, no we, the the, the music uh, uh, modules are carefully, carefully prepared for the app. That's why when Vic, uh, when he, um, Tibor was talking about importing them and it takes so long, um, these are not your typical music files. They're not MP3s. These are um, um, FLAC files. They're very carefully selected for their frequency response, and they are volume balanced one against the other, so that they so that each song will consistently work one behind the other. However, you can customize a program or a module if you like. You can select songs from different modules and and create a custom module for yourself. Or, and we always run into this, a child will say, "I don't like that song." Okay. And if when a child doesn't like a song, you can easily delete that song from a playlist, and 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 we can show that. So you can delete that song from a playlist, and 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 it it always helps. And in fact, if you uh, when you look at your data, if you're the therapist and the parent is doing the program, and you notice that a song only played seven seconds, okay, and at the next time that same song only played seven seconds, then you say that child is skipping that song. So we can just delete that song and not cause the child any distress. So we can delete that song from the playlist. So there's a million ways to customize this program for a particular child. And it's, there's more to it than you'll need. But we, when you want to become the total expert of, of auditory processing, this is the tool to use. Come by our booth. We'll show you. Yeah, we'll show you. Show you everything you want. Thank you. Thank you.